Reasons to believe Michael Peterson is innocent. Michael Peterson called 911 from his home in the early hours of December 9th, 2001. At 2.40 in the morning, he reported to the operator that Kathleen Peterson, his wife, had an accident, that she tumbled down the stairs, and that she was still breathing but not conscious. The dispatcher's written notes during their conversation with Michael used the term hysterical to characterize Michael's behavior. Kathleen had already passed away by the time emergency responders arrived on the scene, which was several minutes after Michael had made the call to 911. When asked to retrace his and Kathleen's steps in the hours before the call, Michael said that they had watched a movie drunk some wine, talked, and then headed outside to sit by the pool. He said that Kathleen had gone inside to go to bed while he sat outside smoking his pipe for 30 to 45 minutes before finding Kathleen in a pool of blood at the front of the stairs inside their home. However, law enforcement officers started to have doubts about the odd and grisly circumstances surrounding Kathleen's death. An investigation into the death was launched with Michael as the primary suspect. Michael Peterson was convicted in 2003 of murdering Kathleen Peterson. After eight years, Peterson was granted a new trial after the judge ruled a critical prosecution witness gave misleading testimony. In 2017, Peterson submitted an Alford plea to the reduced charge of manslaughter. He was sentenced to time already served and freed. Reasons to believe Michael Peterson is innocent. Number 1. It's all in the blood. Bloodstain pattern analysis, BPA, is the interpretation of bloodstains at a crime scene to recreate the actions that caused the bloodshed. Analysts examine the size, shape, distribution, and location of the bloodstains to form opinions about what did or did not happen. Although bloodstain pattern analysis may be a valuable tool for investigators, the credibility of bloodstain pattern analysts' trial evidence has been questioned in recent years. Very little empirical data supports the use of blood spatter analysis in court or any other legal context. The jurors in the Michael Peterson case have admitted that the testimony of the prosecution's bloodstain pattern analysis expert, Dwayne Diva, was the overriding evidence in a guilty verdict for Michael Peterson. Diva was an 18-year veteran of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, SBI, and was the SBI's go-to man on bloodstain pattern analysis. Diva had only ever completed two classes on the subject of bloodstain analysis and was never a member of any of the professional organizations that analyze bloodstains. During his evidence at Peterson's trial, the analyst had, according to the SBI, misrepresented his knowledge and training in bloodstain analysis. He claimed that he had submitted 200 reports to the Bureau. However, according to then-SBI Assistant Director Eric Hooks, Diva had written just 47 reports in his 18-year tenure. After allegedly presenting false evidence in several trials, Diva was terminated from his position as an investigator with the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation in 2011. The legal team representing Peterson, upon being informed of Diva's termination, submitted motions in which they argued that Diva's testimony was untrustworthy. The work of Diva first sparked controversy in 2010, when Greg Taylor was finally exonerated after spending 17 years behind bars. As a result of Diva's testimony, Taylor was found guilty of killing a woman in Raleigh in 1993. Diva testified that Taylor's car exhibited chemical indicators indicating the presence of blood. It turned out that Diva had not mentioned that more advanced testing carried out on the vehicle proved that there wasn't any blood in the vehicle. Five of the 229 criminal cases that were examined as part of an independent audit of the blood testing section of the SBI were deemed to be very problematic. In every one of those five cases, Diva had worked on the case. One of the major sources of suspicion in Kathleen Peterson's death was the large amount of blood at the scene. But when the defense team brought in leading forensic expert Dr. Henry Lee, he said that, contrary to popular belief, 
The blood at the scene indicated Kathleen's death was more likely to be an accident than the result of a fatal beating, as a beating would most likely not produce that much blood. These medium-velocity patterns can be produced by coughing, sneezing, breathing, movement of the hair, Lee said of the blood spatters on the walls at the bottom of the staircase, but added that he could not exclude the possibility that Kathleen was beaten. Lee also said that any blood spatter analysis would be inconclusive. It doesn't matter how many tests you do, he said. You're not going to produce the same scene twice because this is a dynamic situation. You can jump, you can beat a mannequin's head, that isn't real life. This comment was directly aimed at divas who had performed numerous tests on mannequin heads. In the case of Peterson, the North Carolina Court of Appeals agreed with the decision that Diva had lied to the jury, and a new trial was ordered. Number 2. Corruption and Vendetta The prosecution team in the trial was well known to Peterson. Peterson was a recognized novelist who wrote three books based on his experience in Vietnam. Peterson was also a newspaper columnist for the Durham Herald Sun, where his pieces were well known for their criticism of police and Durham County District Attorney James Hardin Jr. Mike Nafong, a prosecutor, was part of Hardin's team on the Peterson case. In July 2014, there was a petition for all of Nafong's cases to be examined since he had been found to disregard due process and omit crucial DNA evidence in several cases including the murder trial of Daryl Howard, who had been convicted in 1995 of the murder of a woman and her child in 1991. Howard, who had been imprisoned for 20 years at the time, was given a new trial in 2014 because Nafong concealed evidence in the trial that led to his convictions. Howard's murder conviction was overturned and Howard was freed from jail due to DNA evidence not offered to the jury by Nafong and the lab director responsible for likely exonerating him. Nafong came to public attention in 2006 when it was revealed that he had concealed DNA test evidence in the Duke Lacrosse case in which three white members of the varsity lacrosse team were accused of rape, sexual assault, and abduction of a black woman hired as a stripper at a party. After the woman changed her testimony, the rape charges were withdrawn in December 2006, and the other counts were dropped in April 2007. Nafong came under scrutiny for his handling of the case. This includes making public a series of false claims, suppressing DNA test findings, and not questioning the purported victim for more than six months after the original inquiry. In June 2007, Nafong became the first sitting North Carolina district attorney to be disbarred after being found guilty of 27 of 32 charges brought against him for conduct in a case that involved dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation, and was prejudicial to the administration of justice. In this case, his actions have made people question his previous convictions and what could have been done to get them. Did Hardin and Nafong omit crucial evidence in the Peterson case? When taking his Alford plea, Peterson hinted that there was a vendetta against him because of his articles implicating the police and DA's office of Durham County. Number 3. Wounds and the Weapon Due to the significant amount of blood that was found at the foot of the steps and the injuries that Kathleen sustained to her head, Hardin argued throughout the trial that Kathleen's death was a result of being beaten by Michael. She had seven rips in her scalp, but her skull was not fractured, her brain wasn't swollen, and she did not have any brain contusions. Hardin reasoned that the seven cuts must have been caused by a blow delivered by a weapon, such as a blowpoke, which is a tool used in fireplaces. A blowpoke is capable of causing lacerations, but since it is hollow, it would not cause any fractures. Diva, the blood spatter analyst, reasoned that there had to have been at least four strikes to Kathleen's head for there to be splatter on the wall. Diva conducted an experiment in which he put a synthetic blood-soaked sponge in the stairway that was supposed to symbolize Kathleen's head. 
He then demonstrated to the jury that he was able to get blood on the inside of his shorts, much as Michael had. Given that there was no evidence of a cast-off blood pattern, he hypothesized that the weapon had been cleaned in between blows. The defense team came to the conclusion that Kathleen must have stumbled while going up the stairs, fallen backward, and hit her head on the doorframe. This would have resulted in severe cuts and the significant amount of blood that was seen at the landing of the staircase. It seemed possible that she knocked herself out first, then attempted to stand when she awoke, but was disoriented and slid in her blood, which caused her to fall again, causing the additional wounds. It is quite probable that she had a significant amount of blood on her face, as well as in her hair, and if she had been coughing, a pattern of blood staining would have been produced on the wall. The prosecution maintained that Kathleen had been beaten with a blowpoke. The prosecution's theory seemed to be based on Kathleen's sister, Candace Semperini's claim that she had given her sister a blowpoke for Christmas a few years earlier. Since Kathleen's head had lacerations, a blunt object like a blowpoke became a possible murder weapon. The police did not find the blowpoke in Michael and Kathleen's house when they first searched the house. Since the prosecution couldn't prove that a blowpoke was used in killing Kathleen, it wasn't registered as the murder weapon in her case. The prosecution team in the Peterson case is now seen as a corrupt, inept, and possibly vindictive branch of the North Carolina justice system that may have sent an innocent man to prison for eight years. A movie script could not be written with so many twists and turns as with the staircase murder. Or is it death? And then there's the owl theory. Thank you for watching Bad Things. Hit the subscribe button, like button and notification bell and share our channel for our up and coming true crime videos.